Fight Plus is the ultimate digital platform for live sports and entertainment, and they're now offering a free seven-day trial at TryFight.com. Fight Plus is packed with a premium live event schedule, over a thousand hours of live action every year, and a library of more than 4,000 hours on demand, plus exclusive content you can't get anywhere else. Fight is a great partner of ours. They support us, so let's support them. Give that free seven-day trial a shot, and you'll be a member for life. That's tryfight.com. T R Y F I T E dot com. The recognized symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you are listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the greatest of all time, your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Hot. It's hot in here. No, Conrad Thompson, how we doing, pal? Man. Happy, uh, I guess I can say this. Happy Sunday. It is a beautiful day. Hopefully, yeah, but- the internet and Wi-Fi is just clear as a bell. Hot off the dock, my man. Bringing in them big, just slaying the fish today out there with my man codes. I don't know if you've checked it out, Conrad, or not. But oh, uh, I saw those those whales y'all were pulling in. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. You and I usually record. I think everybody knows now. We've we've been in a Monday routine from almost the very beginning. Yep. Uh, and we've deviated a few times and said, "Hey, we'll endeavor for Friday." I couldn't do this Friday, and and and, and Monday's a challenge for you. So we're recording on a Sunday, which might be the second time ever for us. But I'm excited to do it. Normally, we're a, a, a morning outfit. We're getting it on in the evening. That didn't sound like I meant for it to. Either way, though, <laughs> you're going to be getting it on in the evening this Sunday night. Be sure to tune in to AEW Dynamite this Wednesday. And of course, Rampage on Friday. We're in the go home because Jeff, you're headed to Las Vegas. And as I have heard, the rumor and innuendo is that you're going to come back 10 pounds heavier. And I said that to stupid ass Tony Schiavone earlier today. And he paused as if you were going to wreck a couple of Las Vegas buffets. (laughs) He didn't know what I meant. And I had to remind him, I'm not talking about me or Dave Silva coming back 10 pounds heavier, which would definitely mean we put a hurting for certain on some more restaurant out there. There you but go. You, my friend, you're coming back the AEW tag team champion, you and Jay lethal, the greatest tag team that's ever been assembled, put together by a wrestling genius. Going to take those traps off FTR and your close personal friend, Mark Briscoe going to be the guy to count the three count the pinfall. It's on pay-per-view. Tickets are on sale now. If you're within driving distance, let me just tell you, this is the sleeper AEW show. Jeff, I don't know why, but I've seen some people saying that, you know, this one, that, or this one, this. I think this is poised to be the biggest surprise of a double or nothing we've ever had. Mm. And I think a lot of people are going to be surprised on Monday morning when old Double J wakes up 10 pounds heavier. Are you pumped? Conrad? All kidding aside, we like we like to have a lot of fun around here on my world, but no, uh, pump would be an understatement. You know, you kind of glanced over it. Seems like last Wednesday night, <clears throat> I don't believe in my thirty-seven year career I've ever been a part of a dueling guitar shot. My goodness, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Because I have an issue. Let's, as you're looking on YouTube here, I want you to take a look in the top right hand corner. Oh, now I, I hope I'm not stepping out of bounds or overreaching, but I consider myself at this point, a family friend. Oh God. Would that be fair to say, Jeff, would you consider me a family friend? Oh, I, I had, you know, I had this feeling at about central time. I had this feeling at about. 815. Well, inside baseball, 815, 820, 830, because we were on in the first hour. Right. And by the time I usually get back from my segment, uh, the social media cameras are there or just kind of post-match, post-segment, whatever kind of the duties of the day are. But when you kind of head toward 
your locking room and then you kind of go back to your setting and I get me plenty of electrolytes and you pick up that phone more times than not. I would have to say my podcast partner will have some type of message for me. Is that fair I, to say? It no, is. No. Fair to say. Okay. So, so, so with that being said, the queen and all her glory, the dueling guitar shots, the reaction, Brother Jay Lethal got stripped down to his skivvies. I can't tell you what Cody thought about Jay's underwear, but uh, I'll just say it was a highly entertaining segment. We yes. took those boys to the woodshed again, mm -hmm. like yes, we saw this Sunday. Yes. And it occurred to me, Conrad, oh, look at the queen. If you're seeing the video version of this, uh, that girl can throw us a, a, a mean forearm. I'll just say that. Right. Oh, between old Cash Wheeler, man. He found out a thing or two about a thing or two. <laughs> but Conrad, that is when it dawned on me. I'm like, well, it's a surprise to somebody I know as well. Not just the people in the arena in Austin, not just the people that were tuned in on TBS, not just the people that were tuned in on ITV or ESPN in uh, Australia or uh, Eurosport in India or all of our other broadcast partners. But there was quite the surprise at 11 p.m. Huntsville time. 10 yeah. So, so my, uh, you know, I, as you may know, I had to head out of town and do a road trip uh, with a fellow kind of unexpectedly last minute on Thursday. So whenever that has to happen, I try to do what I can, you know, spend a little time with the wife, focus on, you know, couple stuff, wife stuff. Balance. So that usually with my wife does not involve us watching wrestling. Yeah. I can so, so we were doing other stuff. And so then she's got to go to bed because, you know, she gets up at 4 AM and goes with her personal trainer and does all her routine and all that. And I still sleep for a while. So I got time. So once she goes to bed, I'm like, man, let me just see what's going on in AEW. Dee, 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 dee. And you know, I do what I always do. I look for my friends. I'm watching for the stuff I want. But now normally my friends, if something big's going to happen, okay. they say, Hey man, might want to watch seg four. I'm not saying I get spoilers, <laughs> but I at least get a heads up. I'm in seg four and it's worth watching. It's different. It's not it's, the same old, same old. I and think imagine my like surprise. It. I think you'll like it sometime. The terminology that has been used. <laughs> yes. And, and then she slides as well. She deserves. I'm so excited that Karen was there. I can't wait to see her just slap the piss out of somebody on Sunday. <laughs> and I hope she's bringing an extra Louis duffel because you're coming back there you with go. 10 pounds of gold. So AEW TIX is where you can pick up your tickets. Of course you can be like me and order on pay-per-view as well. Uh, I am going to be watching on the bleacher report app. Uh, I am, uh, I've got that on my Apple TV. So that'll be my jam and the way I watch, but let me say this. This is a sleeper pay-per-view. I'm not saying I know anything. I'm just saying AEW always delivers on pay-per-view. Check their paperwork. Check the record. You don't want to miss this one. AEWTIX.com. By the way, we've buried the lead. Not only are you winning the world titles this weekend. By the way, who had that on their bingo card? Jeff Jarrett challenging for a winning a title on pay-per-view. Not only did that happen, but the AEW upfronts for this past week. And if you're familiar with the television industry at all, you know, the upfronts are a pretty doggone big deal. And of all the wrestlers that they could feature and they could focus on at the AEW upfronts, I know what you're thinking. Well, they probably focused on Kenny Omega. They probably focused on the young bucks. I know for sure they had John Moxley front and center. Well, there's no <laughs> doubt the world champion MJF was there. Should we even go down the CM Punk road? You could go on and on with all the great <laughs> fine talent under contract at AEW. But when it came time for those images of the upfronts to go viral, Here we they go. knew. <laughs> they knew there's only one person you should feature. It's double J, uh, J E double F, J A double R E double T. AEW collision is coming your way, and you were featured prominently. Jeff, does this mean you're going to dominate the Wednesday show, the Friday show, the Saturday show? owning a baseball team, winning the premium live events, running the house rules. 
how are you going to do all this, Jeff? Like, Conrad, have you found a way to clone yourself? What's the plan? Well, there's been a lot of things that have happened since we launched my world that were not on either one of ours bingo card. No, so never say never in this industry. Absolutely never say never. No. Hey, man, all kidding aside, Conrad, collision. How big? How oh, huge? huge. And, and I'm glad, you know, on today's topic, we're going to get into because at the end of the day, Global Force Wrestling, this is part two of it. There may even be a part three or maybe even four. Doing the research and breaking it down, we'll see where you guide me today. Uh, but th there's a lot of meat on the bone. But it's all about the television industry. That's the yes. driver. It just, at the end of the day. And in under five years, five hours of primetime television, it just goes without saying the brand is hot and look, there's maybe it's not for everybody. And maybe the WWE is not for everybody. And you know, the controversy and our pal controversy creates cash, just all, all the ins and outs. But at the end of the day, it is this plain and simple. Warner brothers discovery looked at their menu. They've got hockey. They've got basketball. They've got, you know, all kinds of different programming and they wanted two more hours of primetime wrestling. That just says a lot to me, not only for AEW, but for the industry as a whole, but pretty damn man. exciting, Conrad. I really, I mean, it is a, and I know as a wrestling fan, we're like, Oh, great. And then some folks are saying, Oh, there's now there's too much wrestling or this or that, or, or, or the numbers and the ratings and all that kind of stuff. Look folks, the people running the industry are making these calls. I just think it's um, it's an exciting time, and I can tell you a common thread that I even from time to time had thoughts when I would watch AEW prior to six months ago was, my oh God, they've got probably fifteen main eventers or you know whatever, right. not enough slots for a two hour show or too much talent or the balance or this and that. We just doubled our prime time. Uh, it's, it's big. It's really big. I'm excited. I, I'm excited for everyone involved with AEW because and on the one hand, careful what you wish for, because there, there really is a, uh, a doubling down of so many things, but on the upside and my delusional optimism, wow, what opportunities we have in front of us. So yeah, the short answer, Conrad, yep. I think I'm going to dominate Wednesdays and Saturdays, but that's just mine and your opinion. Well, it's not our opinion. Those are facts. And, uh, I mean, listen, check his paperwork. Jeff Jarrett's been a top guy everywhere. He's gone. AEW's no exception. He's <laughs> dominated dynamite. He's crushed rampage. He holds dark and elevation in the palm of his hand and he's going to dominate collision. Like everybody noticed when that collision logo came out, boy, that's reminiscent of nitro. Well, listen, those Bob Vila glasses are right around the corner. Slap nuts. Uh, you know, second verse same as the first, here we go. Now, listen, I, uh, I had a big heated debate with Eric Bischoff. It's one of our more uncomfortable conversations. Oh, uh, wow. what we were hooting and hollering about collision. Tell me and, about it. Well, here's the thing. I think, and I understand that Eric has become a polarizing figure. Well, he's probably always been one, but he's my friend and I value his opinion and I value it for this reason. He is uniquely qualified. And I mean, as like the only guy who has been in this spot working at a high level with Turner like this to put live television on that show successfully and profitably. He's also been the guy who saw how to do it wrong. And he can talk about the things he did right and the things he did poorly. And I appreciate that perspective, even if I disagree with it at times. And so he and I had a big debate about the show. But one of the, the knocks on our, our pal, Tony Khan for a long time was, oh, he's hiring all these wrestlers. Listen, you just didn't know the plan. The plan has now revealed itself. He has essentially three rosters and some people will hear that and argue that, but we talk about AEW or WWE as having a brand split with a raw team and a SmackDown team because they have two big old important live shows. Well, now so does AEW. Now I'm not saying that there's going to be a brand split, but I am saying you have twice as much time, which means you have, tw you need twice as many wrestlers. And Oh, by the way, he's also got ring of honor. So it all makes sense now. And I don't know all the details. I do know that Tony was willing to bet on himself. It looks like that has paid off in spades. I'm really excited about what's to come. Don't even get me started on Wembley. I think it's an exciting thing, not just for AW, but for all of wrestling. And you said it best. 
that there is an appetite and an interest like four years ago, if, uh, yeah, let's talk about four years ago before the AEW television deal was announced. I mean, everybody in wrestling, we're going to talk about it today with our topic in global force five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago. This was, the, this would have been a dream come true to have just one show on Turner. Mm-hmm. Now the idea that there's three shows on Turner, those are, those are opportunities that, you know, companies like a GCW or an MLW or an impact or a global force or whoever would have been a new Japan would have been thrilled to have. And Tony has done it in short order. You got to give the man his props. I am uh, really excited to see you dominate. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, somebody limps away there with the world champion, a, a new world title, and you manage a way to just yank it from him on June 17th. Because I think <laughs> if you really, well, listen, we put the poster out. We didn't do it, but the company <laughs> AEW put together the poster of Jeff Jarrett at Wembley. And just based on that alone, over 60 something thousand tickets were sold. And I'm just thinking to myself, self, if they want a ratings bonanza, if they just announce you, versus whoever has the title on June 17th at collision, man, you, you probably do what? Like a 10, 11 rating night one stirring it up. My man, my man can stir it up like that. No, no, it is great. I would love to, I'm going to have to go listen to you and Eric getting fired. It's, up it's uncomfortable. Time. Is it really? Yeah. He, I, I don't know. It feels as if, uh, he's just, um, soured completely on AEW and and I'm not like an AEW apologist. I'm just saying, hey man, it's good for the industry. Like yes. Like I don't know all the financial details. Those haven't been disclosed. And and it's none of my business. It's not my money. I don't care. But I'm just saying I feel like there was all that rumor and innuendo. And so when some of that stuff was confirmed or some not, and then there's all this other rumor stuff and he's like, well they shouldn't have done this. They shouldn't it's like wait a minute now. I'm not there. You're not there. Here's what I know. There's two more hours prime time wrestling on television that's a big deal that's a big and and no matter what you think of well television is here and broadcast is there whatever it is it's still a top five cable network oh it's a top five cable network are you kidding well yes not just that when you kind of look now at the consolidation there's uh comcast peacock you know there there, there's the different groups the abc espn the Warner brothers discovery, that, that group, there's, um, uh, Viacom paramount, all, all the different groups. They're in the top three, uh, of, of, of media companies. And, and when you kind of look around the entire globe, that's where it gets really, really, really interesting. And look, uh, with the writer strike going on, the, I believe NASCAR renewal is up. NBA, I'm going to get this wrong, but the uh, NASCAR, NBA, WWE, uh, uh, there's lots of sports rights and WWE, if you will, sports entertainment, but there, the industry just continues to evolve because look, if you're no stranger to this podcast, there's a lot more than just cable television. There's broadcast and cable and digital and streaming, and then all the content created out of that. And then you have your global play, your international play, two more hours in prime time i can't say it's game changing but man it's knocking on its door it's big they 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 made a statement when i say they pronouns pal uh, warner brothers discovery to me made a statement doubling down on wrestling i think it's great if you love the squared circle what a time it is to be in this industry yeah the the other thing that i was going to touch on uh, when I was looking at the notes and then you just hit it just a second ago before we roll tape Memorial day weekend and labor day weekend from the old guard mm-hmm. were two weekends. You never ran ever. Right. You just didn't. It was the beginning or the end of summer. Kids are getting out. I know that's sort of yesterday's news, but there's just so much going on this weekend, a Saudi event. And I hear there's a pretty good cash number attached to that event i'm sure you, you think <laughs> you know here's what's funny too uh you know that i think people just lose sight of that and we sort of gloss over it oh i don't ever I, and, and i don't know that that number is out there uh but i mean listen i don't think it's unrealistic to say that 
there have been reports that it's fifty million dollars for a weekend. Oh, you mean another WrestleMania? Thank you. That's my point. Like, yes, you know, you've got all the pomp and circumstance behind a WrestleMania, and it's like, well, we're going to do a couple. Not only we're we going to do one night of WrestleMania, we're going to do two. And then we're going to do a couple abroad and we don't really have to promote it. We're just getting it to show up and blow up some pyro and have some fun matches. Goodness gracious. And I understand there's political and blah, blah, blah. I understand all that, but I'm just saying when you look at the appetite for pro wrestling globally and domestically now, because to your point, Turner's just doubled down. Now we got five hours of, of, of AW wrestling. And now there's of course, five hours of WWE wrestling. So there's 10 hours between the big two of new original content every single week on television. Two of those being on broadcast, the rest being on cable 12. I count NXT. It's oh, only sure. NXT. Sure. Sure. It's, I mean, 12 hours in prime time. Yeah. It's a lot, man. Yes. Anyway, I'm excited. I think it's a big deal. And, uh, let me, let me tell you, we're talking a little bit about money today and we're talking about the product. Well, when it comes to money and products, I don't think there's a better way to do it than with Henson shaving in the way they've done it. You know, we have talked about this razor a lot here on the program and Jeff, I got to be honest with you. I had a fellow who, uh, who hit me on Twitter and said that he didn't like this razor and I, I defended it with my life, Jeff. And the reason I did that is because I love it. And I've put like a hundred people in my real life on it, not counting all the thousands that have picked it up from hearing it on our show. But I said, Hey man, are you sure you're putting it together? Right? I think you're putting the bottom on upside down. And he kind of argued with me. And then he came back and relented and said, dude, I double checked. I did exactly what you said. I had the bottom in upside down. This is the best shave of my life. I mean, I was doing low key customer service for Henson shaving. Cause I believe in this product that much. They're a family owned business. And I feel like they have created the best razor ever made. I know it's the last razor I'll ever use. But not only is it better than what you've been using, it's also cheaper and money matters y'all. Let's just talk about it. This is a family owned business, Henson shaving, and they make parts for the international space station and the Mars Rover. I know what you're thinking. What a razor company. Well, they're not really. That wasn't the original plan. They're an aerospace parts manufacturer. And what they've done is they've taken their aerospace grade CNC machines to start cutting metal razors that are less thick than a human hair. We're talking about 0. 0.0013 inches. Now what that means for me and you is a more secure and stable blade. That's going to give you a vibration free shave. It gets better. The racer also has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream. That's going to make clogging virtually impossible. What you'll appreciate about Henson shaving is that it really is a razor that will last you a lifetime. There's no planned obsolescence. There's no proprietary blades. There's no plastic. There's no gimmick subscriptions. This is just the best razor, not necessarily the best razor business. Let me elaborate. You see the Henson razor uses a standard dual edge blade. Jeff's familiar with those. So is your grandfather and every other wrestler. But the reality is it's not only better than all those other razors. It's also cheaper, but this gives you the benefits of an old school feel and the benefits of new school tech because pop pop never had a razor that was 0. 0.0013 inches. It's the best shave you ever had. And at what a great price. You see, once you own the razor, the replacement blades from Henson are just three to $5, not three to $5 a blade, not three to $5 a week, not three to $5 a month or a quarter, three to $5 a year. Now, as you can tell, I'm rocking a beard. That means I don't need to shave as much surface area. I'm talking $3 a year. How do you beat that? Let's say no to subscriptions. Let's say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com slash my world to pick the razor for you and use the code my world. And you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you visit H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com slash my world and use the promo code my world. Jeff, we've talked about this razor a lot. It's one of my favorite products we've ever endorsed. I can't wait to hear. What do you think of Henson? And, and have you let Cody try it yet? Uh, Cody has, uh, you, I, I think we went into great detail. Uh, he is, uh, he's a Henson only man. I love it. He's in a Henson. And from his very first shave at 16 years of age, he was a Henson man. I, I think the, the coolest thing was the look on Karen's face. Cause she had to help him a little bit and all that. And 
She's like, hey, you got to get up under your uh, jawbone and all that. But that Karen was just like, do what? And I said, listen to the, uh, listen to Conrad talk about it. But, and then she went on site, just the details. And I was just sitting there looking at the two free, uh, uh, Dave Green, shout out, pal. <laughs> Two it's a great product. I think it's the best razor I've ever used. I know it is. And, and I love it. Of it. Like my, my barber who does this for a living and has for over 20 years, tried it one time and she said, oh, this is the one. So she ordered it. She uses it for all of her customers now. Yeah. Like industry professionals love it. My dad uses it. Cassio, everybody I know in my real life, I've said, just try it. I got one in my travel bag. I got one at the office. I got one at the house. And here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you how much it costs, but it's more affordable than you think. And remember, it's a one-time purchase. I was used to having to go down to the drugstore. Man, they keep them behind glass and under lock and key. And 3 to $5 a year, it's a one-time investment. That's less than you think. And then for me, man, it's going to cost me $3 a year. It's just the best. Check it out. Henson Shaving. You'll be glad you did. Conrad, and you know, for years and years, I've, it's, we're 37 years in. I, my travel back. Yeah, I've had the exact same routine. I got my... Q-tips, I got my face, just uh, literally everything. It was always, okay, hey, honey, stop by Walgreens, CVS, whatever, need rate. Taking that out of the equation, it's kind of crazy, which leads me to believe, like I used to say, when the kind of, I don't know if you were even ever had this thought, but when they first changed and made a three-door pickup truck before the four doors. I remember when, that. When they added the third door, I said, this is freaking brilliant. But then yes. I got aggravated about six months in. I'm thinking, what took them so damn long? Yes. To, it's been there. Uh, where's Henson Shaven been my entire career? But I digress. It is the best razor by far I've ever used. It just is. No. Uh, is is that a razor that you... Uh, listen, I know wrestlers do uh, a little yeah. more grooming than some other folks, right? Just regular everyday folks because, well... You things are required you you rocking a henson for that too i only shave my face oh i what oh you buzz the rest buzz i got you i got you all right well here we go let's talk about uh global force wrestling let's jump into it just just because two different things and and look people were like hey lucky horseshoes our man and we were i was going to jump in and say look eric's not all full of piss and vinegar, but, um, uh, he is going to be, uh, Wednesday night. I've got a little thing uh, called AEW dynamite, but Wednesday night, May 31st, Mr. Bishop, oh, next Wednesday, a week, a week from tomorrow. Yes. Yes, exactly. My shirt that I have on the shoe world order, I uh, love it. a, uh, a, you know, an O to Mr. Bischoff and the NWO, but Eric, uh, you better get your meet and greet, go to shoesbaseball.com. shoes, baseball.com he's going to be there for opening night uh the town is they're off there they are we're everybody in town in springfield Illinois is pumped eric's going to be there uh there's just something about i gotta say man last year when kevin nash was in the house and the nwo uh the game was a rain out conrad and uh every one of uh kevin's meet and greets that were pre-sold not 50 percent, not 60 percent but a hundred percent of the people that bought the meet and greets, and I won't give the number because it was a big number. You start doing the math. Every one of them showed up. So uh, I'll just say this, the city of Springfield cannot wait to get them some uh, Eric Bischoff. So shoesbaseball.com. Uh, this Saturday's Cubs Cardinals uh, legends classic too. Uh, anyway, very, very fired up about that. And then the other housekeeping note I want to say is Russell quest Conrad, our video game. They put out a statement this past week, and it is pushed. They're going to be announcing the date uh, before the end of the month, but it is a great delay. And the reason I won't get too too deep in the woods, but when you get clearance in another region or territory or country with a different language, it is a enormous domino effect because then you have to go back in and put this language, Conrad. And not just the text link, everything. You got to put all kinds of things in. So that being said, Russell Quest, another delay. Not there's some folks, I'll say internally, that that are a little bit frustrated because we really had our sights set on it was supposed to be the second week, but Russell Quest and the pod father who's in it uh will be coming later this summer. Pretty exciting about I'm very excited about that. So that's the house cleaning, Conrad. Take us away, pal. 
I'm excited to talk about Global Force. We uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. We talked a little bit about uh, in the archives the formation of Global Force, what the plans were, and a whole lot more. We did that last month, and we left off talking about Hermie Sadler and how he how important he was to the project. But I'm curious, you know, we know that things are fractured to say the least with you and Dixie. What was your relationship at that point with Dixie? Were you on any sort of speaking terms? Are you mortal enemies? Are you guys suing each other? Do you still have business together? Like talk to me. Yeah. So uh, we're still, uh, as far as the timeline, I left, I resigned uh, Christmas week of 2013. 2014, um, just to kind of bring everybody uh, up to speed, we just announced, uh, launched the website the day after WrestleMania in 2014. Um, uh, me and a guy named Dave Broom, uh, creator of uh, The Biggest Loser and a bunch of other reality shows, we partnered up on, on some a small level. He immediately wanted to do kind of a Jeff and Karen reality show and all that. But as far as me and Dixie's relationship, it truly was not good, not bad. It was non-existent. I resigned. Uh, you know, I heard things in the office, you know, you know, the chatter and what's he doing and why'd he do that? But there was never any like zero conversation, like none. Um, I, I think I said last episode, you know, their attorneys uh were were appreciative, were very appreciative of how my attorneys handled it. It was a very clean resignation, um, everything by the book. Uh, I, you know, I made sure and took a lot of counsel on that. Cause I just, I, and I said it, I said it on an interview or a couple of interviews. I, I, and to this day, very appreciative for the TNA years. I just knew and boy, uh, as things rolled out, but, but I absolutely knew that my time, um, as 2013 came to an end, uh, when me and Toby's attempt to uh, buy back, acquire uh, controlling interest, when that fell through, um, I knew my it was my time to move on. So let's talk about your dad, another major player. I know we touched on this before, but let's just sort of refresh everybody. What is the nature of your relationship with your dad here? Are you discussing anything with Global Force? Does he have any uh, stake or interest at all? He, he was surprised that I resigned. The only people that knew I was resigning were my attorney, Toby and Karen and my kids. I, I, you know, um, I, you know, later as years went, you know, cause I, I still stay in contact from time to time, um, with, with a lot of people, but Andy Barton, uh, we still talk often, um, Creed Williams the following year. And we'll get into that. The TNA hall of fame situation, um, you know, he was very appreciative. <clears throat> it was not sticky. It was not muddy. It was no issues. Um, and my father, when, you know, when I let him know, he was surprised, but he really thought, I guess, like a lot of people, he was one of the first, like, oh man, what happened? Like, what was the blow? Like, there was one big issue. And I'm like, there really wasn't any there wasn't any one thing other than I spent 11 of 12 months tr trying to, 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 you know, uh, acquire the thing because I just don't have confidence moving forward. I see the writing on the wall. I know the numbers. I thought I knew the numbers good. Now I know I'm great. I just don't have any optimism to where things are headed and all I can really do. Um, it, it, this is what I thought in 2014 is probably j just continue to butt heads with with Dixie and the Carters, and I didn't think that was going to be productive at all either. Let's uh, let's talk about TNA talent because I'm sure we've documented it many times before. There was always discussion in the newsletters that there was a camp, like you're a Dixie guy or you're a Jeff guy. And then later it would be you're a Russo guy or you're a Jeff guy. And so there were like different camps where there was some political gamesmanship on who was with who. And so we knew like Dutch was a Jeff guy and that sort of thing. I'm curious when the announcement is out and people know you're leaving me, just knowing a little bit now about how the wrestling business 
goes, buddy, your phone was lighting up like a Christmas tree. I'm sure. What are you doing? Where are you going? Talk to me about that. It blew up. It really blew up from if you're thinking of somebody that either worked at TNA or was working at TNA. Look, I'm sure I'm going to leave. You know, I would say more people. There was much more than 50% of the people reached out. And a lot of people thought I already had like a complete blueprint of what I was doing. Like, yes. you know, just, Hey, hey what, what are you doing? Um, Hey man, I'm available. My contract's up here. If I'm not available right now, I'm this. And I'm like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. I, I tried to let everybody know I have, I, and, and, and I got coached on this from my attorneys, but it was also a very diplomatic look. There's nothing to discuss right now. So we can talk about anything. I, I'm because I don't have anything right now. I'm, I'm, I know that I'm going to do something. I know that I'm going to launch a company and I, you know, I, it depends on when you're asking, but there was no, uh, deal in place, uh, or any of that. Yes. Conrad, everybody, it was pretty amusing. And even folks, WWE, anybody, uh, I had a lot of people inquire. I think it now I underestimated the, I get, I don't say interest, but it was like, what don't you own that? You know, some people start, I mean, cause they just didn't know. Don't you have majority, you know? And I'm like, no, no, no. I had majority in years and, and that kind of stuff. It was very, very confusing. Very confusing. Since you mentioned it, uh, tell everybody again, what percentage did you have still? Cause even though you're leaving, you still retain ownership and impact 18, 14. Okay. Uh, and, uh, 14%. I'm not asking for dollar figures. What sort of influence does that? Cause some of our listeners wouldn't know if you have, if you own 14% of a business, what do you get to dictate? Nothing. Okay. So at, on some level 14, I'm not saying that to be funny, but I'm saying a lot of our listeners are like, well, he's an owner. Well, there can be lots of owners of a business, but if you don't own 51% of it, if you don't own the majority of it, if you don't have the lion's share of it, it just means there's another way for you to get paid. It doesn't necessarily mean you get to do, you have any influence, right? And I could, I, and I'll just kind of play the, the, the rebuttals I would get Conrad, you be me, but, but you started the thing. Well, that's true. But I, you know, we, as you recall, we needed an investor and they came in and <laughs> when they put all that money in, I got diluted. So well, yes, can, I, go ahead. No. Don't you have any say so? Well, uh, no, <laughs> but I do get paid twice. So that's good. I get paid for being a performer. And, and if I help behind the scenes, I get paid. Well, for why that did you leave, Jeff? Well, because I wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun. I mean, uh, that's why everybody leaves, right? I mean, that's that when it comes down to it, you didn't. I mean, listen, I know that people oversimplify this. And a lot of times people talk about, well, I want control and people talk about, I wanted a better schedule and people talk about, I wanted more money. Let's just sum it up in a sentence. People leave because they're not happy. Yeah. That's it. I mean, like if you're happy and you're like, man, I'm thrilled. Well, that guy's not leaving. Right. That's right. Well said. Um, now listen, it's important. Just the context here. Because there's a lot of questions at the time about what does this mean for Ring of Honor? Because Ring of Honor had at different times had sort of a hokey pokey relationship with TNA. We're in business, we'll do stuff together. No, we won't. Okay, now we're back together. Nope, now we're at odds. And so I'm sure when a lot of people think, well, Jeff is out, well, maybe he's going to go over here because the Ring of Honor management at times, you know, it, it changed. Well, did you ever have any serious conversation whatsoever with Ring of Honor? Okay, so you'd have to Google machine, but I, I believe in early 2014, Cornette was in charge. I, I and, and and I'm just trying to think of the timeline because look, I didn't have anything to offer Ring of Honor, um, except my 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 own services. 
And I don't think they were interested in Jeff. And I don't think I was interested in them just because of, you know, uh, if I wanted to wrestle, maybe I could have stayed at TNA or, you know, that I just, I, I, I wanted to look at creating a new venture. That was kind of my mindset. But uh, as far as Ring of Honor, I'd had a couple of conversations, but not really about Ring of Honor, just with Cornette. But, well, but Cornette, Cornette was not running it. I mean, Cornette left in 12. He left in 12? Yeah, he, he was not there. By so 13, who, he was completely out. Okay, so was it cough? Because, I mean, I've had, I don't say on again, off again, but a very, very distant social relationship uh, with cough. But Look, I, there was, I don't think there was interest on any side in, in anything during this time. That's why I was, I didn't even know who was running it. That's why, I, well, hell, you can tell I'm confused exactly who was running it, but there was no interest either way. Well, um, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't think that model would work. Uh, or you, you, you wanted to own your own thing. I mean, the, the reality is you were, let me, let me, I, I'm trying to speak Jeff here. I don't want to work for somebody else. And if I went to work for ring of honor, I'd be an employee. And if I was happy with that, I'd have stayed at impact. I wanted to do my own thing and cart my own. So I, yes, that is, um, true. And then an addendum to that, I'm not even say partial true. I think, yeah, that's true. But I think also that is, is that. Let me make sure this sounds the, 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 the comes out the right way. The spike relationship, <clears throat> now we're talking early 2014. In 2009, 2010, 2007, 8, 9, 10, it was really good. I thought there was <clears throat> an opportunity in cable television to create a new brand. At this time, Ring of Honor <clears throat> had been around 12, 13 years what were they on at this time? HD net. I, I just didn't see diplomatically in the, these day, the, in the, the days we're talking about ring of honor, just like I, I think, and I say this ECW still gets chances today, but they were going for a niche audience, the hardcore stuff ring of honor was going for a pure wrestling audience. I didn't think that would create mass appeal. I, the, my, my business mind was go for a more mass appeal. I understand. Um, you know, we talked about everybody who's potentially been interested in reaching out. Was there anybody who reached out about, Hey Jeff, if you got something going, I want to, I'd be interested in hearing about it. Is there a name that we might be shocked to hear that expressed interest? I don't think it's my best interest. I looked at that in the notes and thought, ah, there'd be some people that, 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 uh, I could, uh, and not spill the beans on that, but the, 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 yes, look, the grass is always green on the other side. Okay. So there were WWE people and you don't want to say, I understand. It, yes. I, I got it. Okay. And there were TNA people that the words that were said, Hey Jeff, I know, you know, my deal. You were, a, you know, I'm like, whoa, we're not even going down that road. Right. Right. Well, let me say this, Jeff. I, I don't think, uh, as a fan who thinks I understand a little bit about business, I, I, I wouldn't take it as a negative. If I worked for WWE or I was in management with WWE and I found out that 10 years ago, somebody was at least interested in what you were doing. Like that just means they respected you more so than they weren't happy where they were. Like to me, it's just always like, Oh, hey, I like the way that guy does that. I wonder what he's up to. But that to me doesn't mean necessarily that because you would have had to get far down the lane of no, oh, here's what we got creatively for you. And here's the offer. And, and many times I can't say many times, but you know, the, the, and heck any talent would do this, including myself. Can I have something to use leverage? Oh, dude, that's where I was getting to. Like you took the words out of my mouth. Like, uh, well, I'll tell you off air, but I'm running that play right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm running that play right now. Um, yeah. it's reported in late May that Simon and uh, reached out to you regarding GFW booking Americans. What was your first conversation with new Japan? Do you recall? 
Oh, gosh. My first one? I, I'm not sure. But Simon was, um, and again, you know, his relationship with the new with, with New Japan, obviously, has evolved over the years. And this is where my timelines, I have to really look at it because in a lot of, a lot of things, the timelines ran together um, just because they were stutter starts in so many ways. But he reached out, um, and I, let me back up a little bit. Um, Scott DeBoer came on board uh, in Q2 of 2014, I want to say. Um, maybe Q3, but during this time. So Scott was a big part of, a, of, of the Japanese relationship that we're, we're going to get to. But Simon had reached out. Um, again, New Japan in 2012, 13, 14. Um, and I'm just trying to think of the roster over there. I think Finn Balor, Fergal Divot. Um, I, I'm just trying to think as they were rolling along, uh, Doc and Carl. I, I'm trying to think when the Bullet Club was actually launched. Uh, but j just 212, 213, 214, their business was good. Uh, I know there's going to be some hardcore uh, Uncle Dave readers that's going to say, well, no, it didn't really start technically getting good in here. But anyway, he reached out, w w inquired about what I was doing. I May of 2013 is when the Bullet Club started. Okay. See, so things were rolling before that. I, I mean, but, you know, just so the timing of all of it. And, and Simon was, uh, I always got along really well with him. He was just. And for those folks that don't know, this is Antonio Inoki, the founder of New Japan Pro Wrestling, his son-in-law. Uh, and he he just wanted to inquire on, hey, what's going on? Is there a way uh, maybe to do something? Uh, and, you know, I, I'm telling them at the, at the time, folks, I'm a ways from doing anything, but I am interested in, in working relationships. And, you know, then they would start to pick my brain about the U.S. market. And I'm just like, I think the U.S. market, just because – you know, WWE so successful and, uh, you know, this is right in the era when they're launching their network and there was a lot of chatter, just the, the business, like it's been led for so many years, the WWE awareness in the, yeah, not just in the public and the wrestling fans, but in the television industry, they look at the numbers and this is, you know, now we're 15 years past the attitude era. Uh, and so again, the golden age of cable television is long over, but yet we're all still pu pulling in these big numbers. And again, the ratings game, everybody wants a winner. And when you drill down on professional wrestling, and I'm sure Warner brothers has done this over and over and over 52 weeks a year of original programming that gets numbers that is relatively inexpensive to produce. It's a winner period. Yeah. Well, listen, global force is the real deal. I mean, that was the reason you named it that you knew you wanted an international flair. You were planning on doing stuff in Mexico, planning on doing stuff in Japan. And I'm sure that meant, man, the last thing you were worried about was what am I going to eat tonight? You knew you had to have something ready to eat quickly. Just like you'll need to now that you're giving people guitar necklaces on Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and sometimes Sundays. Thank goodness factor is there for you. Factor is America's number one ready to eat meal kit. It's going to help you fuel up fast with ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. I absolutely love it. I've been rocking factor for a couple of months now and could not be happier. And let me just give you this pro tip. These are fresh, never frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes. You can skip the grocery store shopping. You can skip the chopping and the prepping and the cleaning up too. Seriously. I love it. I figure out exactly what I want. It shows up at my door. I take that little, uh, if you're watching over on YouTube right now, you just take the uh, paper carton that tells you what it is off the outside. It's covered in plastic on the inside. You poke a couple of holes in it, slide it in the microwave. Bam. In two minutes, it is fantastic. I haven't had a bad meal there yet. And I've tried a lot of stuff because they have got 34 different chef prepared dietitian approved weekly options. And I mean something for everybody. You want to count your calories right now? Well, how about 550 calories or less per meal? Done deal. Maybe you're trying to bulk up. You want you some Jeff Jarrett pythons. Well, try the protein plus that'll get you 30 extra grams of protein or more per serving. Maybe you're trying to drop some LBs. Well, they got keto for you, pal. 
How about vegan and veggie? We can check that box too. something for everybody. They can even round out the rest of your meals, not just lunch or dinner. They can knock out breakfast, man. They got stuff like apple cinnamon pancakes and bacon and cheddar egg bites. They got all your snacks and your juices and your shakes and your smoothies. Seriously, over 45 of those different add-on options. Not only is it cheaper than takeout, not only is it better for you than takeout, it's also a whole hell of a lot faster. We're talking a couple steps to the fridge and then bam, two minutes later out of the microwave, you're all set. You're good to go. I absolutely love it. I don't think there's a better option out there. I've tried a bunch of these. This is my absolute favorite. You simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor packed meals delivered right to your door, ready in just two minutes with no prep and no mess clean eating without the hassle head right now to factormeals.com slash my world 50 and use the code my world 50 and you'll get 50% off your first box. That's code my world 50 at factormeals.com slash my world 50 to get 50% off your first box. Jeff, you know, a thing or two about eating. I've seen you put on some man versus food performances here in the South factor, dude, doesn't get any better than that. Does it? It's good stuff. It's probably my lunch every day. Yeah. Or or my third meal of the day. It is. No, it's great. It's that is fellas. You're a single man. Oh God. This is a home run. Are you kidding? I, I, it's, it's that simple because the fast food, uh, it'll kill you. Not only will the price tag kill you. I mean, it just, it's ridiculous, but it literally will kill you. Um, it's cheaper and it's better for you. And it tastes a whole heck of a lot better. Like it just checks all the boxes. Check it out. You're going to love factor. Yeah. It's the ease of it is, is game set match. So listen, let's talk about spike here. Because I think we all know with the benefit of hindsight, the relationship with spike and TNA seem to be eroding by the day. And it's reported in the observer that your deal to exit TNA included a clause that stated you couldn't go on TV with spike. Is that true? Zero. I mean, that is totally false. Okay. Um, and you know, are you you saying something in the observer was not true? uh, Well, I hate to say it. Uncle Dave, you got this one wrong. And that is total fabrication. All right. Well, let's just, let's just figure out where it came from. I'm not saying that to be funny. Yeah, that's interesting. But but here's what I know. And and because I want to be clear. I think sometimes we come on these podcasts and you or Eric or Bruce or someone will say a variation of what you just did. Total fabrication. And that implies that Dave Meltzer is lying. I'm looking right at the camera right now. Oh boy. Dave Meltzer is not lying. He wrote what he believed to be the truth. Yes. Now here's what happened. Someone lied to him. Like, I don't believe for a second that Dave Meltzer goes out of his way to lie. Okay. I didn't. Okay. I know. I know that, but I'm saying a lot of people, our, our podcasts become polarizing because people think, oh, they're saying Dave's lying. No, 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 no. Someone lied to Dave. So I want me and you to let's reverse down the rabbit hole. For sure. Let's figure figure out where it came from. Dave didn't just say, well, here's what they wrote. No, no. Somebody told him that. So who do you think could have told him that? Who would have been chatting from the impact side and told Dave that? That's where the assumption, I think you jumped already down the right, the wrong rabbit hole. Okay. From the spike side. Okay. Dave's got sources everywhere. And if you're in rooms long enough and just listen, You'll hear names come up from PR folks or marketing folks or really production folks. Well, hey, I heard this. Oh, where did you hear that? Oh, it's in the office. Where'd they hear that? Oh, you know, the online stuff. They don't call it dirt sheets. They don't call it, you know, you'll hear right. different phrases and terminology. It's the online newsletters or th- this. Okay. you And you just, oh, which one? Well, you know, there's that um, F uh, F W four online or, or yeah, you know, they just that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, I don't have firsthand knowledge, but who, uh, let's go. Right, we're doing a little crime scene investigation. Who would have the motive to say that? I would say well, the impact side, the hundred percent. The why would spike go, go? There's no, to me, it's more logical to think that when this comes out, Dave calls somebody and says, Hey man, what do you make of this Jeff Jarrett news? And then whoever he calls, they start chatting. I'm going to guess 
this is probably not the right answer, but I know we already, boy, we've done a number on him on my podcast. Apparently had to be Terry Taylor. One of the people, right? He was already gone. Okay. So, but my point is Terry had been in constant communication with Dave for a long, long time. There were other people in impact who did that. I got you. So I'm curious who had a Terry Taylor esque type relationship. Like it's plain to see when you watch the, read these old newsletters, Blair talked to Dave Heyman talked to Dave, certainly after the screw job, Brett talked to Dave. So there's certain people you can just tell. Like, I mean, it was in there all the time. I don't know why people don't do more with Eddie Gilbert. Okay. Eddie Gilbert's talking to him. <laughs> He's advocating for his friends and I get it. We would all do that. That doesn't make Dave a bad person. No, I, I, no. But, I, but I know sometimes when we say total fabrication, the, the translation is Jeff Jarrett calls Dave Meltzer a liar. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not somebody totally fabricated. Somebody told him that. And I just want to know for, if you had to guess where would something like that come from? So. Let's go down this rabbit hole. This is this is fun. Everybody in that company, right, would have different questions. Let's just say some folks would say, hell, I don't blame him. His opinion meant nothing here. Or, I don't blame him. He should have left a long time ago or whatever it may be. Right. I think the one person in there that I don't know why he did that or well, he can do all he wants. But he ain't, he can't do anything on Spike. To me, all roads point to Dixie. So you say it, maybe Dixie said, well, did, "Did Dixie have a relationship with Dave?" Well, I don't know, but Dixie could have told somebody else. And then, right? No, I believe that, like a hundred percent, that any of the Dallas folks could have said, "He can do whatever he wants as long as he don't bring it to Spike." And like he's gonna get there, we're already whatever. I get that. Any of that. Yeah. But I just wonder how the trickle down is like, who's on the horn with Dave for him to report that. Um, I mean, listen, let's just talk about it. Did you have any contact with spike? You had a relationship with some of those folks. I'm sure when the news comes out, because you said it right at the top of the program, I told my wife, I told my attorney, I told my kids, nobody else, not even your dad knew. So when the spike people find out does spike call you and say, Jeff, what's going on? I would love to take a little credit for Nostradamus. But when I heard the news, Conrad, was it the, was it August when their deal was up? I, I think it, but when I heard that it wasn't being renewed and it was an absolute, I remember getting Dave Broom, who was my production partner in Los Angeles was like, wow, did you call this? And I said, I really, really thought that they would get not a long-term extension. Conrad, and, and, and man, this is good chatter because, or I think it's good chatter, but it's, I thought, why are you going to take a program off the air? Can you replace it? Yes, you can replace it with a CSI or something like that, but original programming, hanging on to hope. I didn't think that they would just say, it's over. I thought that was headed in that direction. I'd like to have said, yeah, I was leaving because I knew their deal was completely fried. I knew it was on shaky ground. I knew that they had lost extreme confidence in the brand in many, many ways. I knew that money was tight and renewals weren't coming up. I knew the Kurt Angle situation was going to be very interesting along with other talent. I knew that the Rocky Road was definitely in front of them because I had a sense that Dallas was, hey, I, I we told you back in 06, we're not funding this bad boy anymore. You're going right. to be standing on your own two legs. And when the payables, and we kind of touched on that, uh, were com way upside down. When all that stuff, it, it was like, if if something doesn't happen, it's really going to be ugly. And that's why I didn't want to be there with the ship completely, completely sank. And I thought it would happen. Did I think it would happen in 2014? I don't think I can actually say that. Um, but to answer your question, Conrad, not until after their deal was over. And I heard from Spike, I didn't call them. So that would have been, uh, 
they announced that it was going to be up in August. They wind up signing an extension to carry him through the end of 2014. So they finished the year in November. They announced they're doing something else in 2014, but so they finished 2014 there. Yes. Uh, on, 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 on that, but the deal was really up because it was, a. Uh, uh, I think that the contract ran through September. I think they gave him a quarter, but that yeah, they, was- they let him finish out the year. Yeah. And that's, well, that's a budget thing. Go ahead. That, that's a budget thing. But but um, once it was over, I didn't hear, and we'll get to it. I, I didn't hear from them till 2015. And, and we'll get into that when, when I met with them and, and everything that went with that. Let's talk about talent for a moment because the WWE has a massive amount of uh, talent cuts coming too. There's a new TV deal that's signed and it's for less money than they imagined. Their television rights fees are not quite where they want them to be. Remember now, this is 10 years ago. This is not now. And talents cut at the time, Oksana, Evan Bourne, who we know as Matt Seidel, Camacho, Brodus Clay, who we know as Tyrus, Kurt Hawkins, Teddy Long, Drew McIntyre, and Yoshitatsu. So it's a twofold question. One, were you excited that there's an influx of talent? And two, did it make you nervous? Damn, WWE's TV money's down? That ain't good for me. So here was what Broom, when did their deal, when did all that come out that their rights fees weren't a grand slam? 2014. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I, I'm just trying to think. And I don't, well, it doesn't matter. I was trying to think which news came first the impact, uh, TNA news, renewal news, or the WWE rights. It was, it was May of 2014. So you announced in April, a month prior. So about six weeks after you announced, is when it comes out that they, they have made a deal and it's, it's for more money, but not nearly what they imagined. Okay. That wasn't that big a deal. The impact new TNA deal being dropped by spike was big, right? It was, it, it was, uh, again, global force. We're wanting to launch a company and the guy who left is walking into our office and going to start these pitch meetings. But now, why did Viacom take him off the air and this guy left? Just, I, for lack of a better word, a lot of confusion in the marketplace. The WWE was disheartening, but it wasn't as, look, that wasn't big news. They're still on the air. They're still getting great ratings. So, and they got a bump, just not what they were expecting. They were getting fantastic ratings. Big numbers. Uh, well, listen, I mean, people would say, oh, they're down. and they're. I mean, I even saw some people say the ratings are minuscule at the time. But what those folks are doing is they're comparing it to a prior generation, not only of ratings, but of television. Yeah. And, and, and it was all changing. So they do wind up getting quite an increase, but it's not what they had projected, not what they hoped for. So the that's stock Wall takes Street. a tumble. Uh, yeah. It's and, and it, yes. But the, when the stock takes a stumble, it does feel like maybe the, the interest and the narrative on yes. wrestling might yes. be changing a little bit. And I'm wondering from your perspective, who once again, now for the second time have walked away from a guaranteed deal and pushed your chips all the way in and said, Hey, I'm going to bet on myself. Part of you has to be a, l- a little nervous or is that where that delusional optimism kicks in? Both. I okay. delusion, but I, the, the uh, again, hearing the realistic tone in Dave Broom's voice was heck it. I don't mind telling it. There's my stories on here. There was probably a few self-medicating nights to go along with that because he, you know, he's in the television business and okay, l- let me back up again. Dave was hell bent on let's go do a reality show on starting a wrestling company. We'll, we'll, we'll just say Jeff and others or Jeff Karen and others and Jeff Karen family and others, but kind of starting this and, you know, I'm in the middle of going to Japan and going to Mexico and, and talking to this. And he goes, Jeff, that's all fascinating. The startup entrepreneurial spirit that maybe there's even a business that it, it opens up our pitches. We don't have to just go to this network and this network and this net that's going to carry wrestling. And, and Conrad kind of my, Naivete, not really seeing big picture. I wasn't interested at all in doing a reality show without a TV deal. Maybe that was a a dumb thing to do, but that was what Dave wanted to do that. And when 
he told me, hey, Jeff, yeah, the WWE news, that's, you know, they're still getting good numbers, but, you know, that's that's the reality of the situation. There's It's not a endless pot of gold, but this TNA situation, hey, dude, that, that show's getting a million viewers a week in prime time. They canceled them. That ain't good, man. That, that ain't good. What I'm hearing, Conrad, and you can probably relate to this, what did I hear? What I wanted to hear. Oh, Dave's trying to sell me on this reality show. Dave's trying to sell mm. me on this reality show. Dave's trying to sell me on this. Dave, I want a wrestling show. Long-term growth. That's what, you know, th that's what I do. Da, 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 da. Anyway, does that paint a picture for you? Kind of where, no, yeah, absolutely. where my head was at. And that was a, look, I uh, told you I've made a lot more screw-ups than positives, but we're here by the grace of God. Let's talk about Toby Keith. We talked a little bit about him, you know, when, uh, we first started the global force discussion, when you were trying to see if you could bring him in on the impact deal. Now that you're going to branch out and do your own global force deal, was there any opportunity to do some business with Toby Keith or had he sort of moved on from that? He was, <laughs> here's what's great about Toby. He, when I say pardon the pun all in, he's all in. He was ready to go, but he's also, uh, I mean, we covered it. He's on the cover of, yeah, hundreds of country music magazines. He's been on the cover of Forbes before. They don't put just country music superstars, singer songwriters. They put businessmen. And so, and look, I didn't have to, it was very simple. Jeff, if we get this plan together, kind of the whole pin of it all is a television deal. He, he, he was ready, willing, and obviously able to go, but we had to get a deal together. So, you know, as far as funding things, um, he, he, he was ready to put up his cash just like he was in the TNA days, but it had to make business sense. It, it had to have the plan and the ROI and, and, you know, look, didn't have to be cash positive day one, but he had to kind of see the route to it. And I respected that and, and agreed with it but he was ready. Well, you're trying to get ready. It feels like you're doing a lot of hustling in this area. You're working uh, with triple a and you're going to work on the triple mania show and, and do a hair match. And we've talked about all that in the archives over at my world on youtube.com. But in terms of just, Hey, we're, uh, we're bringing home the bacon. I mean, GFW's what we would call pre revenue. Yeah. And now that you've left impact, Yes, you have points, but it's probably now going to be even more subjective because now you just really got to kind of take their word for it or fight and scratch and scrape. I mean, you're not actively involved in the business at all. So you got to go sort of sing for your supper here. No. Yeah. I mean, to on the TNA deal, you, you, you can, I don't even have to read between the lines when, um, when they have payables as high as they were. Do you think there were any dividend checks, Conrad? There you go. See, I wasn't going to hit it over the head, but when, when you really lifted under the hood and you saw, Hey, there's all this outstanding, AKA all that's got to be paid. And then if there's profit left over, you'll get 14% of that said. Otherwise there's no money coming from impact. And if you're not working in impact and you're not getting paid there, brother still got to go make some money, but he still wants to launch this business. Yes. So you're, you're trying to just patch together income in other places yeah. until this gets up and rolling. Right. You always, as Christine Jarrett, uh, taught me, you got to save for a rainy day. Yes. You, you just do, but you know, it was high pressure, dude. You got five kids, blended family. Uh, See, there you go. You took the words out of my mouth because I've asked a few times before, like, let's not forget. Now there are some people who have the the good fortune of this being an investment vehicle. You are the third generation of many promoters who made their profit and paid their bills and fed their families on profit from running wrestling shows. And now you find yourself not in a position to do that. So we're going to go to work in some other areas and still work around the business and in the business while we're launching the new thing. But oh yeah, we still got kids who got to go to school and they hope to go to college and yep, we got a household to take care of and we got hungry boys who are coming back for seconds and 
Yeah. We got a house to upkeep. I mean, real life is a thing here, right? Oh, buddy. I mean, as the most pressure in my life from a business perspective, and this takes in a lot of ground, was 2014, 15, and 16. No doubt. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Even um, more than 02 and 03? Yes. Wow. Yeah. B because 02, yeah, it's just, it was a different time. Um, remember, coming off the WWF and WCW, and at that time, uh, only two kids, um, you know, just life was a lot simpler, if you will. Then you add in a third kid and the ups and downs in the personal life. And then me and Karen start our blended family. And then, you know, the ups and downs of TNA. And then you get into, okay, I see the writing on the wall and you just, you know, told the quick story. It's buried. I, I do not see it, uh, you know, uh, as Dean Broadhead would tell us many times, folks were in a financial death spiral we're not coming out of this. It just look at it. Let's get real here, folks. Um, if the renewal doesn't come in and it doesn't sound like it's going to, and this is in 13 when we were trying to acquire it. And, and I'm thinking in my mind, that is what Dean needs to be saying. So Dixie will hear and go, we've got to make a radical change and it didn't happen. But, um, but yeah, pressure was big Conrad. I mean, and I didn't even, at the time, Conrad, I knew it was big. I didn't realize how much it was wearing on me. I, I just didn't. It was really wearing on me. I, um, I just can't imagine. I mean, you know, when you talk about, I just want to add context. You've spent your entire life in wrestling and then you're going to walk away from WWE and many would think burn a bridge, go to WCW. They go out of business. You got a little bit of a shelf life there to figure out what you're going to do next. We've covered the whole debacle where the, the buys are misrepresented and you're spending based on bad information and crap out, lose it all, find this angel investor, but boy, now the politics are in and it's a struggle with your dad and you lose your wife and, and you've got all this. And you say, oh no, 10 years later, that's when the real trouble was. <laughs> this is unbelievable, Jeff. Oh boy. Well, no, that's, um, I mean, it, you know, I've had so much time to reflect on it uh, and I had a lot, you know, I had a, a lot of time in 56 days, but it gave me a lot of clarity, Conrad, to really, really look at, do I regret anything? Zero, none, because every obstacle now today is an opportunity for me to learn. I've, I've really tried to drill down on all of it. The, the miscalculation that if Jeff, you you're leaving because like you said, not happy, but you didn't have any confidence in, in the nose pulling up. Now, if they go out of business or, or lose that deal, how's it going to affect what you're, what you're going to be starting here? That that's a big deal. That, 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 that was a big deal. I kind of, I didn't kind of, I misjudged that. Okay. So now that the other thing is I just kind of went into, no, I don't want to do a reality show in its best days. What does it pay Dave? Well, it's this and that you really got to get into season two and really season three is where you can start making money because season one, you got to get a hit and season two, you kind of have a lot of leverage. We'll see, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, Dave, I'm not a reality guy. <laughs> well, not just that. Let me ask this. You know, you, uh, you're a big time family guy. Anybody who follows you on social knows that, but you know, you all, you, we, we all just sort of refer to our experience and try to learn and grow from that. And you had seen another wrestler and Hulk Hogan and how a reality show was probably in hindsight, not good for his family. I'm sure that weighed on you. It did. And, and, and look, Dave was, we shot a two sizzle reels that he's like, we will protect it. You got to have drama, blah, da, 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 da. But, but you got to have controversy. Jeff, you're in the professional wrestling business. Your entire issue, your, your entire industry, entire industry product is built on good versus evil. Any television show, you have to create that. You're right, Dave. Anyway, just kind of the, the, the lessons that I've learned, Conrad, when I look back 
I learned more in 14, 15, 16, and 17 uh, as well. Uh, but, but uh, man, what a wild ride it was. Uh, and it wasn't all bad. I mean, we're going to get into some things that were a lot of fun and what ifs. But, you know, as I sit here and we just talked at the top of the program about Dynamite and then into Collision and the timing of everything. And, yes, the Khan family goes without saying very well funded the amount of talent on the marketplace and you kind of look at the timing of Jericho and Moxley and even the young bucks and, and, and the ROH crew and just kind of how the dominoes all, and, you know, we, we could go on and on and on. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, I go back to, it's all in God's plan. You just, you, the, the timing of everything, either it's time for it to happen or not. I'm responsible for the effort. God's responsible for the outcome. And the outcome of this was uh, a lot of crazy times, Conrad, in 14 and 15. We'll clip this out if you don't want to talk about it. But can we can we talk about alcohol here? Sure. Yeah. Like, did you feel like, because you said, you know, I misjudged it. And so I'm sure you're a few months into this and you're like, hmm, this isn't really going how I want to. And I feel like a lot of people use alcohol in different ways. So sometimes... Hey man, we just closed a big deal. Let's go celebrate. Let's have a beer. Oh man. I had the worst day ever. Oh shit. Let's go have a beer. And so people find excuses to, of how they use alcohol and in every hey. area. And I'm wondering as you, when you said, man, I just misjudged that I'm sure there is as the provider of your family, a five uh, and a blended family. So there's all this extra added stress. That's never super easy, you know, in any certain, there's no family of five that's smooth sailing all the time. There's going to be problems. And now you introduce this and I'm sure there's probably some piece of like, on some level, there's some guilt, like, damn, did I make the wrong call here? And do you think you used alcohol more as a result of that? Uh, here, uh, here is, and look, this is, uh, you, I mean, the amount of time that I've spent Conrad thinking about this and discussing this, that is, and you, you can probably relate to this. I don't do good with idle time. I'm much, right. better, much better than I used to be. Um, but you know, I, I think now using my time, you know, I think I stay in the gym longer now because yes. I, it, it's, I'm using it as a positive, I, my prayer and meditation at times when I, first got sober were 10 or 15 minutes every hour every morning i mean every morning now it's up to an hour or so so using things productive but conrad here was kind of the end of two uh so fourth quarter third and fourth quarter of 2014 into 2015 and even into the 2016 running grand slam and uh end of that was the 15 i don't want to get too jumbled up here but hurry up and wait Mm. That, that was a disaster for me because you can only do so many things. And then you say, okay, you have the meeting in two weeks. You have the call coming up four days from now. You have this All right, you know, maybe a little independent booking here and there, but th there's only so many things you can do in a startup and mm. idle time. Uh, again, I was not a good manager of my idle time. And so that turned into drinking time. And that's I when that, that is when, um, I can't say never in my entire life, but I was never ever. Well, when I worked, you never had a, a, not a drop until after the show was over, not a drop. And then you start breaking those cardinal rules and you have, Hey, you know what? I don't have anything, uh, after my one o'clock call. So man, that lake looks good out there. I'll have me one at three o'clock. You started doing that on occasion. Then the next thing you know, it's every night at five. And then the next thing you know, it's oh shoot. I'm going, I'll do my, I'll have a late lunch and you have one here. That's when, you know, the pattern is so easy to see now. Yes. It's so easy. But during the time a day drinking here or there, it's an issue. I mean, it is a real, real issue. Uh, and again, coupled with what you just talked about, it is, oh boy, stress, stress. Yes. Yes. And that's, you know, however you want to slice and dice it, mood and mind altering drugs, which alcohol is and a bunch yes. of, others, but alcohol is, 
you change the way you feel. Okay. Why did I want to change the way I wanted to feel? Too damn anxious, man. Right. I, I wanted something to happen then. And I could just, I could see the pieces of the puzzle moving. Toby was ready. Uh, the production company, you know, I thought there was plenty of talent in the marketplace, all the different positives. Uh, and again, you know, the, the news of, oh, wow. <laughs> Viacom just canceled wrestling. Hmm. Delusional optimism kick in. Oh, that's okay. Hey, bro. No, Jeff, that's not okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. To, to all those kind of things. Do you think along the way, uh, one of my favorite terms, do you think you ever experienced analysis paralysis where you oh. just get so bogged down in, I'm, we'll do this and we'll do that. And so then it, that just sort of consumes you. you. You made a reaction there. Elaborate for me to this day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm a, I love data. I love looking at numbers. Uh, you know, you can look at, um, I'm just glad that I don't go in the rabbit hole too much. Cause you can look at YouTube views and go oh God, and get way in your head. Oh, you can just kind of look at it, which it's again, it's another metric. If you just have the right relationship with it and kind of understand it and also understand, okay, let's go in there and take out India and let's take out UK. You know, let's just look at us YouTube views. It, it's a, it's a different context, but it is a, a measuring point. You know, everybody gets tied up nowadays on ratings versus not even, um, attitude era or 10 years ago, they do. I mean, they wrap their head around year over year or two years ago or this and that, do you know, TBS and I think it's TBS or TNT or, or both. They've lost 20 million. 92 to 71. So whatever that percentage is when AEW launched. So uh, you got 21 million less homes. That that's a big deal Now you can really think about that and you can paint a beautiful, shiny picture or completely negative picture. And at the end of the day, it, it's a, it's a metric. It's just, I mean, it's truly a metric. So, in 2014, 15, Conrad, any kind of little data I could get from the TV industry and, you know, uh, working with production companies, they get, oh my gosh, a massive amount of, of, of data weekly. And then whether it's WME or CAA or what, whatever agency they get it. So you can get all the data in the world you want. Um, again, I'm getting long winded, but Conrad, yes. Analysis by paralysis. I'm overanalyzing just that statement. <laughs> well, let's talk about something else that was overanalyzed in the newsletters. There's speculation that Kurt Angle's status with TNA is going to be in jeopardy. You sort of alluded to that earlier. And a lot of the rumor and innuendo is that he'd be your number one pick to build a promotion around. What was your relationship with Kurt? Did you have any sort of preliminary discussions or was that even the thought was that cart before the horse oh definitely cart before the horse uh, you know and i never had a one conversation with kurt about it but my what my mind went to from a um promoter to a talent mindset was kurt's coming off a hell of a contract where's heads it all goes into that is he even interested does he want to pick and choose does he want to go back to wwe does he want to one shot, you know, five, you know, I had no idea where his head was at, but you never want to be the first call. And in those kind of situations when I didn't have a deal yet, I mean, you know, that's way, way premature. Let's elaborate on what you said. I appreciate it. But you said you never want to be the first one calling. That's a leverage sentence. You don't want to be, they call you, you don't call them. Uh, it also comes out in this era and boy, this was big news that Vince Russo accidentally emailed Mike Johnson of PW insider, his production notes that he had been supplying to TNA. Now this is a total accident. He meant to email them to Mike Tanay, And when he typed in his outlook or his Gmail or what, ha what have you, he typed Mike thought it was to today and went to Johnson. Johnson breaks the news and, uh, I'm curious what you think of this story and what you thought at the time and what you think of it now has Johnson or TNA or Russo ever commented publicly on this story. I think everybody has. 
Oh, okay. I don't think it's a. I no, mean, it, I know. No, no, let me ask you this. I, when it happened, so the reason I, I'm just trying to, when it happened, so I'm going to go back to my direct experience that. Okay. So would that have been 2012? When, whenever we were in TNA headquarters, it was Kaborik, Dean, Dixie, Andy, myself. Anyway, uh, we, we're all kind of in a row, and you're looking up on a big screen, and Janice from Dallas w was on there. And I, I think I've told this story. Conrad, have I told this story about at the very end of the meeting, Dixie, uh, Janice, says, hey, Jeff, before we go, wrap it up, because we'd gone over business numbers and just right, right, right. all that kind of stuff. And Janice just casually said, well, Jeff, what do you think? I said, what's that? She said about Vince being back. Hmm. You could have heard a pin drop. I said, Janice, I just kept on a poker face. I said, Janice, I'm not aware of that at all. And, and literally left it that because I didn't want to put Janice in a bad position and I didn't want to put anybody in the room in a bad position. They knew that I didn't know. And, and they didn't I, want to tell you. No. Well, Dixie didn't want to tell me and mandated everybody else. Don't tell Jeff. Got it. Those kind of things were the things that led me to say, Toby, we got to get this thing back, you know? And, and when it didn't, get, I, I knew my best interest. I knew I didn't have a future there. Because if you're going to look, you don't have to tell the minority owner everything, but that if was it's a, a secret who's working there. It ain't for you. No. And especially if I'm quote unquote, the wrestling guy on the ownership team and I'm left in the dark. I mean, being, you've talked about this. If, if, if I knew Eric or had the relationship with, I have Eric now back then, it's a completely different story, completely different story. I, I, I will say that it's just, it's, it, so many things would have just by the communication because playing the two sides and this and that. And I think Eric wasn't getting the real skinny from spike. And I think he thought he was, and it just, there was a lot of mud, muddy waters and it ended up ultimately spike canceling. Um, but you know, when that story came out, my mind immediately went back to, well, I wonder how Dixie feels now about her decision. Was it a well-known secret in wrestling that Vince was, uh, still working for TNA? I mean, clearly, you know, it wasn't I, I talked knew, about out. I mean, I knew from whatever that time was, but I just left it alone. I mean, it right. was none of my business. There's no upside to it. I would have just created, and I'm sure my attorney told me back then, just forget you even know that. I mean, that, that was whew. the Russo haters and I'm not amongst them, but the Russo haters, I've seen theories that say, oh, he, he sent that email on purpose. I don't buy that. Do you? I don't either. No, no that, that was my accident. I, yeah. I, he, here, here's gosh. And I, I, I say this through experience. but also the head scratching side of it. How in the world Dixie did that knowing how Spike felt? I don't understand it. I I'll never understand it. Like I'll never. Now I understand Vince side a lot more now wanted a paycheck needed a paycheck. I get all that. Hey, but, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I, I'm glad you said that. Because I feel like sometimes we have these discussions on podcasts. That's what I was trying to talk about earlier. Like, hey, uh, I know you're trying to launch Global Force, but you work in this AAA show. And I'm sure, like, we even got questions. Why'd you work the AAA show? Brother got bills. What do, you, what do you mean? This is what he does for a living. So, like, I know that that's not fun or sexy, but if you're listening to this, you're probably listening to it on your way to work. Well, everybody in the wrestling business has to do that too. It's not just everybody's independently wealthy. Like when I was a kid, I thought the lady I saw on the six o'clock news, well, she's on TV. She must be rich and famous. She's just a regular person. That's just her job. Like, I think that gets lost. So I'm glad you said what you said about Russo. Yeah, of course he was doing it. Dude needed a job. Why would you not? Like everybody's got to have an income, 
But from a Dixie standpoint, why would you potentially go against your biggest partner, your most valuable partner, where if that relationship goes sideways, maybe everything else is in jeopardy. Why would you risk that to give somebody else a job? Like on some level, hire Vince Russo to work with the power company. Let him do something with Panda. Shoot us some fun commercials for Panda. Or right? call up Kevin K and say, this is what I want to do. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, I understand at the same time, she had a, she probably had a great relationship with Vince and wanted to help take care of Vince and get him a job. I, I get all that. that. There's another way to do it though. To yeah. your point. Yeah. Let's talk about Dixie. She talks to the torch and, uh, well, here's the quote. Dixie Carter, when asked if she had any concern about Jeff Jarrett's mysterious global force wrestling, she fired back quote, not at all. Not even a bit. Don't know what it is. Don't understand it and don't need to the hard feelings about the personal fallout between Dixie and TNA's co-founder Jeff Jarrett seemed to resurface in her tone there, man, how did this get so sideways? I mean, I, I know that's a whole separate thing, but like, it would have been real easy right there to not phrase it that way, but she was not happy. And it almost feels like, and I, I'm not implying there was a relationship of this regard, but I've heard of romantic relationships where it's like a guy and a girl don't want to be together, but I don't want them with anybody else either. And it's kind of like that here where it's like, I don't really want Jeff on the squad, but I don't want him to have success over there either. It's a weird dynamic, right? Ego. Okay. On both sides. Look, I've, I've, my ego, it, it, it is truly ego. There's a great book, Ryan holiday, Conrad, um, ego's the enemy. Um, uh, it's fantastic. He's got a lot of good books, and stoicism philosophy, but it, but he, here's, here's a little inside baseball, not one, not two, but three people told me. Those it's coming videos that we literally were teaser videos that yes. we put together. I mean, just and they got traction, a lot more traction. Yeah. Shockingly, great traction, but there was interest. Um, but three different people let me know that they heard it coming out of Dixie's office. She watched it multiple times, hmm. which told me even at that time before I'd gotten sober and really thought through things. She didn't think in her wildest dreams, I would leave. I think that was the absolute last thing. He'll be here forever. I ain't selling to Toby. I'm going to run it my way. I'm going to do things. No, I mean, no matter if the company's upside down in a death spiral and our CFO continues to tell me that that's ego. Look, my ego made me think, ah, oh, it's not that big a deal. Ego gets us all in trouble, but that to me was the nature uh, of the relationship. She didn't think for a minute. And then the flip side is what the hell is she supposed to say? Because when, I don't know exactly when this interview came out, but she damn sure knew that spike contract situation was on shaky ground, right? Shaky ground and even more shakier ground the debt the company was in and even worse is that it was, it goes without saying that me, Dean and Andy had kind of charted the course. Dixie, you can't pull out of Orlando. Where are we going to shoot our, our, uh, pay-per-views every month for, for the economic don't take impact on the road. Um, how shows are down. Uh, we, we need to figure something out. I mean, down to the point of, I, you know, Don West is leaving. No, he's not. Oh yes, he is. Things are, are not going. I mean, there was just one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, that either was diplomatically warmed or tabled or discussed. And now here she was still sitting at the helm and things were looking bad. So I'm surprised she got on the phone with, with, with the torch to give any kind of comment at this point. You, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, your journey 
and, and, and you be BS before sobriety and all that. And, you know, we've even had, since we've started doing the show, you've had some of those moments where, you know, you, you, you had a conversation with Vince Russo and sort of cleared the air. I don't pretend to understand all the, the, the steps and, and all that, but I understand that, you know, that is part of the process of let's try to figure out, Hey, how can we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? So to speak. Has there been any communication with Dixie? Is that still a box you'd like to check and understand more or where is it now with you and Dixie? She, uh, I mean, the latest text was when my dad passed away. So there will be uh, her kids and my sister, Jennifer and her kids go to the same school. And my dad had seen her at football games and, you know, there's a school South of Nashville that they all attend. So it's not like, you know, I mean, we live in two different stratospheres. We obviously just don't run to the same social circles. Uh, I can tell you this. My view on compassion and l- attempting to look through the lens of the person sitting across the table, whether it's a business partner or a family member or whoever, that's great. That's radically changed my life. and so. I've got, you know, no ill will, uh, none. I have in my heart forgiven her, um, you know, for everything. And and I know my role. Look, it, it wasn't all her. I know I had my role in all of it. I mean, going back to 2002, um, it was a mess and it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. Um, but I think I'm answering your question. Where does it stand? I mean, she'll text from, uh, you know, on the passing of my dad. I'm trying to think. I think she sent a Thanksgiving Day text. I'm not sure. But it didn't complete estrangement. It's just we've both gone our separate ways. And, and um, the, you know, that's that, I guess. You're not cross. At all. Uh, At all. Um, I think... You know, you're on the outside looking in, but as you understand it, that email, Vince Russo, Spike debacle, that's the straw that broke the camel's back with, uh, Spike and, and, and impact. I think that's the sexy story. My gut tells me they made the decision in advance of that. I, I, and I think the domino effect, and I found out later we'll get into it when I resigned. There, there was more, oh, wait, there's a little more fire to this and other things, uh, other things, talent leaving. Mm. Um, and I can't say storylines, but just they were, it wasn't, it wasn't the same product. I was told that by them in 2015, the understanding, the product wasn't the same um, on any level. When you talk about talent leaving, are we talking specifically about AJ styles? That's at the very top of the list. Yeah. I mean, he mm-hmm. is the centerpiece from day one, you know, almost day one. We, we talk yeah, about, almost. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was on the first show and won the X division title. So you can't account, you can kind of say day one, but I mean, he, yes, it was a big. And again, her complete underestimation all of all of that. I mean, me and AJ had the conversation. He's like, dude, when I heard that, I just kind of couldn't believe what went down. He said, you, you just produced that match at, at the last set of tapings in, in, in Orlando in 2013. He's just like, I, I, you know, there, there was, again, the party was over. When did Eric leave? Let me look that up. Did you, have, did you have a discussion with AJ about, we've never really spent any time talking about his departure. Uh, were you guys, were you guys sort of comparing notes about none? No, okay. Again, mine was so tightly lipped and you know, the, the Toby engagement and my attorneys and the ownership and I did everything by the book. I mean, to the T it was Eric, Eric got sent home in October of 2013. Okay. 
uh, and was told to uh, sit out the remainder of his contract. It expired in early 2014. Okay. So we did TVs in December in um, uh, Orlando, and I was on the headset and produced some stuff during that. that I, if my memory serves me correct, it was Nick Aldis and AJ Styles, and I was producing it sitting right next to Dixie. And I thought to myself, you know, this was in second week of December ish. I knew I was resigning on the 22nd. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. all, all that. Uh, it, so it was in my mind, it was, man, this is bizarre Weird. stuff. Yeah, it was all, all that. But look, Eric, quote unquote, getting sent home, I think was also, um, when you kind of look at the whole landscape from Hogan and Eric and Jason and um, when was Bruce gone? I'm trying to think. Uh, okay, so Bruce. Uh, Russo theoretically w w w had been gone. But, you know, in 2011 and 12, there was Vince and, and Eric and Jason Hervey and Hulk Hogan. Yeah. He was released in July of 2013. Okay. Bruce so, so just look at 13 and knowing what I mean, but Bruce gone, Eric gone, Hervey gone. Um, AJ's out the door. Well, his contract's coming up and, and look, yeah. you know, all, all that it, it in, in the death spiral was real. I mean, it was as real as can be. So, when I look back on it now, you just kind of go, well, shit, that's easy. But in the middle of it all, this is where the delusional optimism came in, Conrad, in so many ways. Because I keep thinking we signed the NDA around Easter weekend, or we signed it a little bit before that, but Dixie didn't find out till Easter weekend. So we're talking, you know, February, I think we signed it, and then March and April. So – the, the, the talks and the payables and the, the, the viewpoint of the nose ain't coming up on this. Um, we can't pay this. You know, the Hogan situation was Rocky. Uh, the Eric and Jason situation was Rocky. Bruce, uh, she's got to sell. They've got to do something. We've got to figure, we've got to change. We've got to change. We've got to change. We got to the end of that year. It's like, nope, we're staying course. Whew mesmerizing well what else is mesmerizing is how hard you can get with blue chew i tell you just the other day jeff sent me a text and said man it's so hard even a cat couldn't scratch it and i thought he was talking about like the wax job he had done on his new uh, personal watercraft and then i realized oh him and miss karen are on the road he probably had a blue chew blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis and Levitra, but a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. So you can take them anytime day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now the process is simple. You sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Let's use tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Check it out. Jeff's talked about how he's not good with idle time. He needs to stay busy. He said he spends more time in the gym. Here's what he really does. He's working on cardio. He's blowing backs out nationwide. And Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. We got a special deal for our listeners. Here's how you can perfect your own personal <clears throat> stroke. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code MyWorld at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is MyWorld to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew. For sponsoring today's podcast. I heard a rumor about you, Jeff. Can you, can you just debunk a rumor for me? Is that possible? Hot tag with, oh, go ahead. The rumor is, I know you're not a big tattoo guy, but I heard you got a tattoo. <laughs> Here we go. That's what I heard. Okay. I heard you got a tattoo on your wiener meat. Bluetooth.com promo code. My world. Now you don't see it all at first. 
but it's like, you know, alongside the shoreline at the beach where they have one of those planes and they just bring like a banner behind it and you can read it. I hear when that thing gets going at full sail, you can read the promo code. It even lists the steps is what I heard. Is that real? Step Where, one. Where's so, Cassio? Where's Cassio when you need him? He would have a great rebuttal for this. Cassio is uh, congratulating his lovely wife, Big Booty Judy, who over the weekend, Jeff, made her professional wrestling debut. This is not a joke. Big Booty Judy entered the ring in the main event of her very first show. It was a battle royale, I believe, with 19 other dudes. And one by one, they all went over the top rope. Judy was the last woman standing. Rocket, sci rocket scientist, check. CrossFit trainer, check. 50-yard dash expert that can beat her husband, check. And break his ribs. And break, <laughs> and break his ribs, check. And the winner of the Rocket City Wrestling. Tra uh, uh, Battle you? Royale. Battle Royale, yeah. I mean, it, think I about that. Like, it was the main event of Wrestling Con 6 which is, uh, as I've been told the WrestleMania of Southern independent wrestling. Okay. She goes on last. She's in the main event. She's the only lady and she wins. We got a, we got an Alabama China on our hands here. Conrad, that's going to be the biggest event to hit Huntsville, Alabama until house rules gets there next Saturday. AEW TIX.com. I'm going to be there. I guess what I'm asking is. I mean, before doors open, can we get Judy out there? Just, you know, let's let her do a dark match. I was going to say big booty Judy, get in there and do a little, uh, working out. Who knows? A little dark match, maybe a guitar shot. No, I do not do that. I well, no, I mean, here's what I want to pitch as I understand it. You know, the tag champs have to make the shots. So I know you and Jay will be there, There you go. But, but if FTR already had their travel booked, but they're not needed, you know, uh, maybe you know, we could figure something out. Maybe Cassio and Judy against FTR. Maybe I we can get FTR back on a winning streak. I'd love to smack Cassio one more time. Oh, Just well, we can do it. We can do it. <laughs> hey, let's talk about why we're here. Uh, the name of the show is Jeff joins the bullet club. We've established by now that Jeff calls himself an honorary member of the click. And I can't believe it, but Kevin Nash didn't really debunk it. And he said, oh yeah, Jeff would ride with us all the time. So, okay. So Did Jeff, was an, uh, hold on. You glanced over that. Did, did big Kev kind of, he did. Yeah, he, I, I think on his podcast, click this, which you can check out here on podcast. He, he, uh, he put over the, oh yeah, Jeff was cool to drive with. So See, you're like an unofficial member of the click. I never said that now for the record, unofficial member of the horseman. <laughs> no, that is, I got the shirt. Well, Watch let's not, let's heart. not spill any, any grandparents blood in the parking lot over it. Okay. And then you join the bullet club. I can't believe this is a real thing. It's you and Scott Demore putting together a deal with new Japan. We haven't spent any time talking about Demore. What was his role with GFW? He came on board. I mean, it goes without saying, and look where he's at today. Conrad. I don't know. Well, Hey, you going down under with my man. Come on. Me and Scott Demore are coming to Wagga Wagga tickets are on sale now in Australia. We'll make sure we link it in the description below, but yeah, if you're yes. in that part of the country, we're going to be there before you know it early July. So in the early episodes of, uh, or the, the launching TNA and we've covered Scott multiple times during my world episodes, but look, uh, at this time, Scott was at a place in his life. Uh, I was at a place in my life that it worked. Scott came on board. Um, and when I tell you, you know, he dove in, he's, I'll say well-rounded. He can produce wrestling matches. Um, I'm not going to say he, he's a writer by any stretch. He'd probably get mad if I said that, but no, he's produced uh, in his own promotion for years. Every aspect of the television component, he's actually wrestled himself. So look, he's, I don't know, he goes without saying, he's looking at his title today, very well-rounded, uh, but he wanted to be a part of something. He enjoyed some success uh, in the early days of TNA. We always seen eye to eye uh, from a business perspective. Uh, Sands, uh, 2017 when things went upside down, but look, we've already covered that and I'll take the blame or my share of it. Uh, but no, he wanted to come on board and specifically the Japanese relationship. Um, he's had, um, a good relationship with not just new Japan, many promotions, Noah, uh, others in Japan. Um, he helped with the, the, the you know, just 
he helped TNA in the early days with Japanese relationships. Uh, and so he was a conduit and, um, for the new Japan situation, again, the bullet club getting hot, they wanted to spread their wings. Uh, again, people that are kind of new to wrestling, new Japan, I don't believe had run anything really in the States. And so they wanted to, um, spread their wings in the U S obviously I was putting the pieces of the puzzle together for promotion. And we said, Hey, let's, uh, just form something. Look, there was no, I don't want to say radical meat on the bone. Um, but again, I think they were looking as much for something out of me as I, I just wanted to kind of establish a relationship for future deals. Again, going into a, a, a network, when they ask you, all right, Conrad, I've completely kind of botched what is the reason for all the, in the notes, there was some, there, I knew something was going to trigger me. Whether it was AAA in Mexico, whether it was New Japan in, uh, uh, over in Japan, or any promotions throughout Europe, my vision was when you go in and you start pitching networks or just, I don't even say pitching because there were pre-pitches. There were discussions to get the temperature. What talent are you going to use? What talent are you going to use? And when I kind of gave him the vision, that was something that always turned heads. Hey, I'm going to have multiple, multiple styles of wrestling. There's a strong style from Japan. There's a Lucha Libre in Mexico. Uh, there's, you know, more of a mat wrestling and in, in, in kind of British wrestling and, Every now and then, if they really wanted to hear a story, you go into the G Germany rounds and just all those kind of conversations. So that was kind of the genesis. Hey, Scott, let's form relationships. And, and that's what we did. In Japan, Gato at the time, uh, a booker, uh, not a booker, the booker, he still is, of New Japan, um, a, a, a connoisseur of Memphis wrestling. Uh, and mm. he understood, um, you know, he, he under stood kind of the lay of the land and that's how kind of the relationship of of the beginning of new japan and global force wrestling relationship was love that answer glad to have it uh we should talk about the fact that you're going to come out during the g1 climax and announce that you've signed an agreement between gfw and new japan and you're going to take the mic and address the crowd and you thank them for their support and then we do some photo ops and right after that an announcement is made for Wrestle Kingdom 9, Tokyo Dome, January 4th, 2015. We would see Tanahashi defeat AJ Styles at the time. He's the IWGP, IWAG, G, I'll get it, IWGP champion, their big belt, if you will. Uh, that's going to be third place in the G1 climax. And AJ here is the leader of the Bullet Club. And he has the club attack Tanahashi. And that all leads to a styles clash. And then you show up with Scott Demore and clear the ring. And you and Tanahashi have the bullet club at bay. And Scott is having some trouble getting the guitar case open. He finally does. And the guitar says bullet club. And you smash it over the, uh, the head of the ace of new Japan. And here you are a part of another stable. Is this, uh, is this new Japan's idea? A hundred percent. So Conrad, a little, uh, a footnote on this, this was done in a, a um, is a dome stadium, but the window, it was an open air dome stadium, but there were monsoon rains this day. The humidity could, I wish we had that little crazy stat. It was out. We were pouring sweat, but anyway, the ceremony was done very well. Um, and, and, and look, it was a, you know, I was the baby face promoter, if you will. I came out not as a wrestler, suit and tie, as a promoter, launching a new promotion. But the Wrestle Kingdom 9 was kind of the impetus because of things to come. We were going to hire Jim Ross. We were going to put it on pay-per-view. Um, it was just kind of the introductory of Jeff, the businessman or the executive, into the brand. And mm. that was the whole premise, if you will. And I knew going over there that I was going to get involved in, in on some level in a wrestling storyline. I had no idea to this level when I got over there and AJ and doc and Carl and, and I'll call it the rest of the guys, what they had laid out because all I knew was you're going to be doing a bullet club deal. And so uh, <laughs> I got the guitar made and got the bullet club logo put on the back. 
but how they had it laid out, to me, it's definitely a top 10 moment in my career. I know Conrad, and here's why the bullet club was red hot. Yes. I am a, it's hard for me. Look, I'm a huge Nakamura fan, but Tanahashi, when you kind of watch his body of work and the air guitar, and I'm just, a yes, I love his work, but I love his character. I love Nakamura's character. Well, but anyway, to do this angle and and at the height of it and with AJ Styles involved in it, and we've touched on it, Conrad. So think about this. This is October, right? Mm -hmm. Think about where me and AJ were at just nine months ago. Yeah, it's crazy. And you're back together again. And that that's why this whole moment was super special that me and AJ were back together. He is on, I mean, he's on, top of the world i mean we yeah. really think about what aj did in that uh you know he was a tna guy and he went out on his own again bet on himself yes and just didn't succeed i mean on the grandest of grandest stages outside of the wwe in such a big way and for me to get to do this storyline and sure, I had hopes at this time that I get to work with him together. And look, a lot of the the the, the non Japanese folks were pulling for me. They, we need another promotion. They, you know, you can't be in Japan. I know, uh, you know, uh, Carl. I don't know how many weeks he was over there consecutively. And Doc too. But you know, they'd love to get American dates. So a lot of business, but from a personal perspective. But but to get to do the the angle the way we did it and. Conrad, the cool thing was, is that here I come running down and I was out there the segment before two segments before baby face. And I was with the executives in the ring with new Japan. We shook hands and photo ops and golf claps and all that. And then for me to come be running down and I'm saving the top baby face Tanahashi, you know, for a Japanese audience. Okay. There's a big deal. Okay. Here's, here's our guy and me and him. Uh, and look, it says Scott was having trouble getting it out. I think it was maybe had a little trouble, but I think it was a timing. I had to get ready. And when he handed it to me, yes, yes, yes. So my back is to Tanahashi's. So t it's like, I'm looking one way and he's looking the direct opposite. So they can't jump us. We're back to back, but as we are back to back, but also kind of turning in a circle, everybody on the floor could see my bullet club logo. And so the story was, I don't know if they got into the nitty gritty of it is, they didn't even know who I was going to align with until they saw the logo. And when we did one full circle or half circle or whatever it was, then I stepped back and cracked him and we all got in the ring and embraced. And here we are. And I'm the office member of the bullet club. And that was kind of the running joke. It was a, is a lot of fun. Um, a whole lot of fun to do that special moment for me. Hey guys, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Need to call a timeout real quick here. I wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my world listeners for a while now. It's about all the incredible things happening over on adfreeshows.com. An all new edition of The Insiders is here. Conrad sits down with author and historian Keith Elliott Greenberg to look back on his time with the WWF during the golden era of wrestling. You know, I wasn't working for, you know, the JCP magazine, or I wasn't working for Vern Gagne's magazine as, you know, everything was imploding. I was working for Vincent Kennedy McMahon, and I was watching the, uh, the company expand, and I was watching talent I've been reading about in the other wrestling magazines arrive on the scene. Ad-Free Show's members recently chatted one-on-one -on -one with the hardcore legend himself, Mick Foley, for the first edition of Ask Mick Live. Is there a particular place that you get the Foley flannel? Uh, yeah, I do. I go on Amazon and I type in Buffalo Plaid. Um, Buffalo Plaid is the one that has the, like, the even square checks. And I order them. They run small, so I wear the, I wear the 5X. Uh, yeah, and I've got, uh, if anyone's been watching Most Wanted Treasures, you'll see that I'm literally getting by an entire season with three long sleeve flannel shirts, a cutoff flannel shirt, and about five different t-shirts. And that's pretty much it, brother. 
Hey, that's just a small taste of what Ad-Free Shows has waiting for you, including a brand new perk, getting to join in on the live recordings of the shows with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad-Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. That's right. Sign up today at adfreeshows.com. Of course, Smeltzer was not a fan of the angle. He says the uh, fans booed the angle a lot, and whether it's good or bad, uh, time will tell. He says this is just an overdone TNA angle, but you know it hasn't been done here, so we'll see. He writes things like, Jared is 47, and the only other major promotion he's wrestled in in years is AAA, where he's getting over, but it's as a race-baiting heel American. He doesn't do a lot in the ring, but he knows he doesn't have to, blah, blah, blah. And I think we all know that Dave has a real soft spot for new Japan. I'm curious in, within the industry. I mean, you said it, but maybe we can elaborate on it a little bit. The folks who are in the business, I'm talking about the, the performers, the talent, the guys wrestling, taking the bumps, putting out matches. Certainly being the WWE champ is king of the hill because we know well, you're the top guy at the top promotion. You're probably making the most money and having the most success, blah, blah, blah. Good for you. But there's been a reputation for a long time that some of the best wrestlers, some of the best in-ring performers, not, not necessarily characters and stories and all that, but just what they can do and the stories they tell. New Japan has always been held in high regard and their big belt, their world title, the one that AJ holds here, that's that's up there. I mean, and you're in the ring doing, you know, this, this story with their hottest act with their top American and the guy who's sporting the belt. Like we can't overstate the importance of AJ as champ here. Can we? That's. And again, I think this is Jeff talking, right? I've always correlated. The top guy makes the most money. Yes, absolutely. Top belt makes the most money. Okay. Um, you know, triple a belt, the exchange rate, you made a lot of money for that currency in yeah. Japan. Currency is different, but you got a lot of dates. You wrestled a lot, but you also made a lot of money, but AJ's success story over there. Again, there's a little bit more of a culture that you've kind of got to be around, be around a little bit longer than six months. Yes. Champion. That's where AJ, it, it, they. Unless you're AJ. That's what that. And, and here's kind of the unwritten thing here. Yeah. Dave did like it, but it's funny how Dave absolutely knew that I was not booking or writing this. Of course he not. They knew Gato was. And, and then he, he wins Booker, Booker of the Year in the Observer Awards every year until Tony did. Okay. <laughs> Just saying. But, it, but it's funny how Dave still knocks it. And I get it. Because I think because he don't like Jeff Jarrett. That's it. You know, I think it works for his audience. Okay, there we go. Let me ask you this. Did you foresee a singles match with Tanahashi? Was that I, the thinking? I would have loved it, but I didn't really know what they had in mind. I got you. Yeah. That's yeah. important to remember too. I mean, at this point, yes, you're trying to forge a relationship. And uh well, this is not a polite sentence, but there's always leverage in every relationship. And if you're not sure who has it, that means it's not you. And in this circumstance, new Japan had the leverage, not global force. So if you show up and they say, Jeff, here's what we have in mind. You're probably going to find a way to say, all right, let's figure that out. Even if you don't want to do it, that's yep. we're going to try. We want to be a good partner. They got the leverage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The thing that was exciting me was, uh, about the entire new Japan relationship during this era. You mean to tell me I get to kind of be the point person to put this on American pay-per-view. I, I knew that was a big deal. I was tickled to death to be a part of it. And they approached me. I didn't approach them and say, Hey, I got this great idea. No, they approached me. I thought that was, that, that was, uh, that was a really cool thing. Um, and I knew the product was hot. I didn't know the undercurrent, just how hot it was. I absolutely love this story because we get to talk about how you put 
global force uh or, or wrestling kingdom rather on american pay-per-view uh, as i understand it it's uh it's all going to be through fight and you somehow managed to uh, rope in jim ross we're going to talk about all of that another time but before we put a bow on this episode okay around this same time on impact programming we would see bully ray power bomb dixie carter through a table off the top rope uh, this is uh, a big moment in their history. Did you get to see it? What'd you think? I did not see it. Um, I thought for sure you would have lived vicariously and power no, bomb coached her. I mean, I'm sure. No, I mean, I, you, you're saying is saw it on the first airing. Well, I mean, I, just in my head, you know, that, that was the, like one of their last great angles there with Dixie. Yeah. 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 I, again, I, you go right into and you play armchair quarterback. Okay, I, I I get it, but where are you going with that? I was wondering the same thing. Like, okay, what's next? Is Dixie going to be training with Mean Jean and she's making a comeback, or yeah, you know, what is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's announced that Bound for Glory is going to take place in Japan. That's right. The Impact Bound for Glory is going to take place in Japan, and it's reported that you actually put this deal together before you left TNA with Wrestle One. Can you tell us how that came to be? Just the connections. What's crazy, Conrad, when Bound for Glory actually happened on October the 12th, Queen of the Mountains birthday, I'm in Japan for New Japan. I'm there when it actually took place. But months before, I had, um, again, just in 2013, there was, well, it, it, it could even go back to, I, I wanted to work with international promotions. We did to a certain level back 03, 04, 05. That's how me and Pena hooked up. I've always wanted to branch out and have real working relationships because look, less than, better than, or different. Well, WWE's never going to do that. They've tried right. a different right. thing. I, 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 I'm, I'm like, look, it doesn't have to be this huge financial windfall. We need to have working relationships with other promotions around the globe. I always thought that and tried to get it. I got shot down so many times in, in, in TNA, especially when I won't get into that 2010 and 11 and 12, there was real, no interest. The rinky King thing was another, you know, we don't want to work with, you know, we got to worry about spike and we got to worry about the, all that kind of mess. But, um, the, just the, the whole, well, what's the question, Conrad? Because I, I I got off on uh, uh, Wrestle One Bound for Glory. Wrestle One, the, having that relationship um, was really cultivated. I don't want to say was it 2012, but certainly 2013. But then they made the decision. But but I know there were some financial factors that they needed to do something different because how are they going to put a show on in America? I mean, there was, I'm telling you, there was a, it was a, it was a mess. Domestic. You mean in Japan? No. How was impact wrestling going to put a show on in America to, they had killed, you know, there, there was, the brand was dead in America. Well, and, and that's what we're going to talk about when we pick it up, when we talk about, you know, what's next for global force, because all of a sudden when, when spike is going to end their deal with impact now, both of the companies you founded are looking for a TV deal at the exact same time. And we're going to talk about your pay-per-view deal. We're going to talk about wrestle kingdom. We're going to talk about Jim Ross and so much more in a couple of weeks. We'll be back talking about may 2003 and TNA. We'll talk about Glenn Gilberti getting a push, uh, CM Punk making his debut extreme revolution, taking a shape, uh, the asylum turning on you. That's what we'll be doing in two weeks. But next week, Jeff, we're doing something a little different. We're throwing the keys to our listeners just a couple of days or the day after Memorial Day. And I'm sure you'll have your bright, new, and shiny tag strap over your shoulder. We're doing Ask Jeff Anything next week here on the program. Get involved. Ask a question right now on social media. It's easy. It's on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at MyWorldPod. You can also watch our shows over on YouTube. It's MyWorld on YouTube.com. Be sure to check out all the new swag and merch that we've got, including the infamous last outlaw t-shirt 
That's all available for you right now over at boxofgimmicks.com. My favorite, the grass outlaw. Everybody's outside working in the yard. Why not? By the way, if your business targets men 25 to 54 years old, buddy, there's no better place to advertise than right here with us on my world. You hear some of the sponsors year after year after year. Why is that? Well, because it really works. And with our super targeted audience, there's very little waste. Go right now to advertisewithjarrett.com and find out more about how affordable it can be to advertise here on my world. But Jeff, I'm excited because you sort of alluded to it earlier. Lots of fun stuff happening here in Huntsville. Next weekend, AEW House Rules will be here. Tickets are on sale now, aewtix.com. But at the end of June, we are exactly a month away from our annual Top Guy Weekend get-together. And I can't believe this is real. We asked uh, everybody over at Ad Free Shows, do you want the next event to be in Chicago, as it has been for two years in a row? Do you want it to be in Nashville? Because we sure did have fun when you tried to kill Morgan's grandpa last year. Or... Would you like to do it here in Huntsville? Huntsville got over 60% of the vote. And we've been having some conversations. Mm. The old Eric Bischoff. Less than, better than, different than. This year, we're going to have some fun, are we not? It's going to be a little different. It's going to be a blast. You know, you know, I did some calls this week for our new uh, signups. Yes. And literally... I did four of them this week. Explain what that is. Cause I, when you so sign up, yeah, we, we have promotions going and we do them all the time on social media. The idea being when you sign up as a new subscriber, Hey, you're going to get a little welcome call from somebody on the team. Might be Eric Bischoff, might be Jeff Jarrett, but somebody's going to call and thank you for joining uh, our network over at adfreeshows.com. And, and usually that leads to some fun conversations. I'm sure they're great. There's a coach. I tell anyway, we, I, I had a, I had a blast making the calls and they always, you know, they're supposed to be three, five, six minutes. Sometimes, you know, I said, Hey, I'm long winded. Just like my partner Conrad. Anyway, it always goes into, and I said, well, tell me, cause I like to do my little focus group. Tell me. And they always end up saying, I'm getting so much more than I didn't know. I wanted to see, listen to or watch. Mm-hmm. I know what that that's what is, I said. I've told, I've told Conrad from day one coming out of the pandemic. I said, it's the best value in wrestling. That's when we were all shut up and all this, you know, closed. Right. In. It is the best value. I no doubt. And I know I'm a member of the team, but it's still the best value. Uh, your, uh, conversations with Conrad, mm-hmm. um, Keith Elliott. You like that? Dude, I, 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 I we'll talk off air. I want to, I want to pick your brain on that one. He's a fascinating dude. The Jim Johnson was good. Zahadi was good, but Keith Elliott, I, I want to, I want to pick your brain on it's John Filippelli. I mean, we've had so many fun ones on there that are names. I mean, these are power brokers in, in wrestling and you can only hear their conversations at adfreeshows.com. Check it out right now. And I hope you guys will join us for top guy weekend, by the way, I know it's a month away, but as I understand it, you know, Evan runs that shop over there. He just tells me what to say on these programs. I've been told if you sign up for an annual membership, yeah, you can come to this top guy weekend next month. How about that? Whoa. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently that's the thing. So next week, Jeff, we're going to talk about, uh, well, whatever our listeners want to talk about. It's asked Jeff anything. The the other thing is we put a bow on this because I knew we were getting to the bullet club and all that. And, um, I thought as I started reading the research, because in 2000, I thought we were going to get into 2015. If I say getting on the runway, that's going to be a theme of probably once we get into the next, it's kind of get up on the runways. A part of that, it was, um, uh, production companies, Arthur Smith and Arthur came in and we formed, I want to get to give too much away here, but he, he's the producer of American Ninja warrior. And it took him, I think nine years before that show his version came to light. He's just like, Hey man, you got to get in this for the long haul. And I'm thinking to myself, we're going to be pitching Russell. We ain't pitching, you know, all that anyway, but as a far as, as far as getting on the runway, we'll get into the grand slam tour and all that kind of stuff. But GFW merch. And as I was moving my lease or they changed, I had to change rooms at my warehouse. I dug up some old GFW merch, Conrad. I'm going to let you put your thinking cap. I don't know. Okay. I don't, I'm just throwing that out there. We've got time to think on it. It's not available right now, but 
Hang on. Is there any is there any Global Force Gold merch? We didn't make any of that. Uh, maybe well, we need cards. some. We need like little gold bars as like door maybe, stoppers. Maybe a business card. <laughs> Dude, if we could get like a gold bar door stopper. I wonder if any of those cards, I didn't make them, but the guys who did the, I don't know. That may be a collectible. Dude, we need, you got to get the Rockacon collectible, the Global oh. Force Gold collectible, and what's the other one? We got to get one more. Well, uh, I hey, think. I think on that uh, most hidden treasures or whatever the show. <laughs> You're not going to believe this, but I, uh, you know, after Starcast finished, you know, we just packed it all up and bring it down to my warehouse down here. And I went in the studio the other day to record with Mick and I guess Silva and, and Clint from Hershey had been over to the studio, to the uh, warehouse looking for something else. And in my office now, or my studio at the, uh, at the office in the back, you know, you, I think you've got a video back there. Oh yeah, that's several. There's uh the white shirt that Ric Flair was wearing when you stabbed him in the freaking dome this oh, time last year. We still got it, don't we? We still got the shirt. And I'm like, uh guys, I don't know that we can have that in here. Like, I mean, it might be okay, but can you imagine without context of what that was? Like my DNA's not on it. No, sir. Shit. <laughs> i know who's is on it we were worried and concerned and when he I, did that little I feel like it was it was only 10 months ago it feels like a couple of years ago doesn't it it's weird yeah it does feel in one hand yeah anyway. i mean since that time you've become a two-time aw champion there you go and you've uh you're the first ever international champion i mean i'm excited i think is you know, speaking of global force and global force gold you're gonna have some global force gold this weekend Double or nothing is here. This is your chance to see Jeff Jarrett win a world title on pay-per-view in 2023. And uh, as I understand it, it's your dad's turn with the book in heaven. So you're going over, baby. <laughs> it's his six months. You can't follow that, pal. Take us out. <laughs> we'll see you next week right here on My World. Peace. Hey, everybody. This is Ian Riccoboni, the voice of Ring of Honor Wrestling. Same with Conrad, they were very appreciative of my time and they really worked with my schedule. The Conrad's team uh, met me at the hours that I needed to meet them to walk through the specifics. Uh, the paperwork was clear, the communication was clear to make the decision super easy to work with. So we actually went from a 30 year mortgage, we refinanced down to a 15 year mortgage and now our house is gonna be paid by the time the kids go to college. If you wanna save like I did and like Nick Aldis did and so many others, uh, in the professional wrestling world, please go to SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! At SaveWithConrad.com.